Hello everyone, I'm Jill Foote Hutton, co-editor of Studio Potter. I'd like to invite you to become a member of Studio Potter today at studiopotter.org. And thank you for listening to another installation of our author chats. In the November issue of Studio Potter, Harry Levenstein wrote Wonderfully Wild in Alabama, an interview with Zach Sirke. Harry currently lives in the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts and works as the artist in residence and lab technician at the Bard College at Simons Rock. A practitioner of wood firing, Harry interned with Peter Olson, apprenticed with Simon Levin, and was a resident at Golden Bridge Pottery in Pondicherry, India. You can follow his adventures in clay on his blog, Chop Water, Carry Wood. Zach lives and works in Fairhope, Alabama, where he has taken up the mantle of his family's history, digging clay, working as a potter, teaching wood firing workshops, and investigating the history of the place where his great-great-grandfather, Homer Howard, made pots in the late 1800s. Harry, Zach, and I enjoyed a meandering conversation that began with an admission of my own nervousness about engaging a conversation with folks who are engrossed in material and process. Any concerns were swept away by the allure of clay, and we quickly moved on to considering the tangled layers of history in Mobile Bay, looking at that history against a premise set by author Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. Without further delay, let's get into our visit. In my own practice, Zach, I'm very much about like fable and story and all of those things. And so I feel really inadequate when people are as into material as as you and um, Harry are. But God, those pictures, man, this so, I just wanted to like, it just all disappeared. And I was like, yeah, I want to stick my hand in that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I really liked your email last night with the questions about that were more about story, fable, pulling in some of my own sense of legacy or meaning, being uh, as involved or having the connection that, that I feel so, so closely with the local traditions and geology. Well, great. That's awesome. Both the stories that you've written, Harry, I love the sto- I love your storytelling style and the images from- Isn't he a great I mean, writer? Oh, he's a really great writer. And I wanted to go down and just like stick my hand in every part of that quarry. Delicious. And I get that. I am interested in this parallel that I saw about like indigenous tribes using low fire and the colonizers finding high fire, the Japanese aesthetic. And then I'm listening to this braiding sweetgrass book and I'm like, there's something, there's something here. So picking up on that, I read your email to my wife last night because she had just, she has a, um, a feminist book club and she just got done reading Braiding Sweetgrass oh, awesome. a few months ago. So, and she was reading excerpts of it to me and I'm big into plant and it was just, it was wonderful, like listening in to, to her read on it. But I, I read her the email and we like wound up staying up for like an hour after lights were out just like talking about ceramic history and indigenous culture and Japanese traditions and how how all this fits together so I actually had a bit of a primer wonderful wonderful I'm I'm excited to hear that I I moved back home to Fairhope after graduating with the idea that I would build a small wood-fired kiln on my family's land, I own the land now, and then apply to grad school and get a terminal degree and, and teach because that's the only job for potter. I wound up getting a huge amount of kiln building materials given to me by an industrial fire brick contractor uh, as I was looking for, you know, just anything to build a wood kiln. And, you know, I got two semi trucks full of refractory material when I was 22 and kind of bit off more than I can chew with this big Onagama project and it took me almost 10 years to get it all put together and and that really changed my direction honestly with the the roots that I feel for the um, the local area and the kind of work that I did in school studying the geology and the ceramic history of the area and the fact that it's a the community has been very supportive here it was pretty easy not to go anywhere i teach at my own studio i teach a local art center i've taught workshops 
all around, you know, we did a grant last year in Denmark to go over there and, you know, basically have a meeting of the mind and trade notes with Danish folks and Japanese folks who all who dig their own clay and things like that. The pandemic kind of curbed some of those plans, but, you know, the grant's still ongoing as an international collaboration. Harry has had a lot more traveling under his belt. And I feel like, Harry, your read and experience on other cultures, practices, and traditions are invaluable and, and very different than mine. I have not been to India or to Japan or China or you know any of these, these places. I haven't done a lot of residencies around the country, but uh, certainly I've been, you know, I'm not trying to devalue my own experience, but yours has been very, very hands-on. And you've gotten a really good perspective, no doubt. Harry, you do, as Zach says, have a lot of a global experience with wood firing. And when you open this article, you mentioned that you wanted to learn about Zach's philosophies and processes, saying that you coveted inside info and tidbits that might broaden your perspective. Um, mm -hmm. So what did your experience and conversation with Zach bring to you? Zach and I have never actually met in person. But I learned about Zach and his work the day that I began my apprenticeship with Simon, because Simon had just returned from um, a road trip where he went down and hung out with Zach. And did you guys, you guys didn't fire together, did you? No, he, he came down and taught a workshop at a studio in my town. And I had looked up to Simon's work for, for years and met him and chatted him up at conferences and stuff. You know, I took him to some of the clay deposits that I bring everybody to. And, you mm -hmm. know, we talked shop. He came over here for dinner and we, you know, hung out in the studio and stuff like that. Yeah. So it, it, it was good. He came home with one of your mugs in hand and I loved it and used it often while I was living there with Simon. And he also brought some old shards back that he had found on the beach with you, I think somewhere and gifted me a couple of those. But yeah, it was, it was then in, in 2017 when I learned about Zach and his work. The thing that I was most interested in in learning to wood fire and wanting to apprentice under Simon was um, becoming more adept and just competent in loading and firing wood kilns and getting results that are exciting and not, you know, just brown. And I felt like Simon was exemplar in that field and um, and Zach was too as soon as I saw his work. So it's just kind of been an online relationship chatting uh, ever since then. And uh, when I when I got the idea, I got the idea for this article after I had injured my leg late last year and you know I was unable to be in the studio and I figured I should start writing some stuff that would be a good way to spend some time and um, uh, I've also been interested in for, er, prospecting local materials and using that in my process. So all of that in combination is like, okay, I should talk to Zach about how he does it because I like how he's doing it. And so, yeah, after having spoken with him, with you, Zach, I've, I've, learned a, I've learned a few things that I'm really excited about, one of which is kind of a reinforcement or a, a validation for my own process and the way I handle materials that I find and that that kind of intuition that you've talked about where you go out and you've you've done a significant amount of testing but at this at the point that you're at now it's more of a of a feeling that you're getting when you're working with certain materials you, you kind of know how much of this one to use and how much of this one and what the kind of it's like cooking cooking without a cookbook kind of thing. You've done it so many times with the recipe that you can kind of spice it up and, and uh, improvise as, as necessary. And uh, that, con that kind of confidence with material is really, really cool. Zach, do you think you can, from that, circle back to what you were saying about Harry's global perspective? I'll get there. I just want to um, acknowledge that what you said about confidence with material you know, sort of like a cook without a cookbook knowing your ingredients. I mean, that comes with a, like a great sacrifice. I mean, I think I've always had that kind of confidence and just sort of shooting from the hip and being fast and loose with materials. I've lost whole kill loads, you know, and yeah, I mean, it's been a while, but I think, you know, I've dug clay from this one area for 25 years 
and every every bucket of clay has gone through treated it like it is the most val it's going to make the most valuable body of work that um could be and i just put everything through the kiln and paid attention and it's taken me a long time to discover and get the result that i wanted to from a wood kiln you know much like harry said about simon's work and wanting to apprentice with simon in order to inform loading and firing a nonagama type kiln to get specific results like i always wanted those specific results and I had to really figure out what was going on in my materials and firing practice over the course of like five or 10 years in my own kiln to like, you know, beat my head against the wall and changing things up until I got it right. But as far as tradition and global experience and things like that, I'll address that now. And I should start from the beginning. When I got into clay, my second semester of college at Eckerd, I had grown up in Fairhope, which was founded as an intentional community in the 1800s, kind of kind of an outlier town in the South and anywhere for that matter. And uh, big sense of community, big sense of uh, pride and identification in the idealistic history of the place. And when I went to college, Eckerd College is like idyllic as far as colleges go. 1,500 students, the campus is right on the water. It's like summer camp. But I felt so disconnected. I felt uprooted. And I felt like, you know, a city like St. Petersburg, Florida, which is you know, suburban sprawl, a grid. I was like, how do people live like this? I was so disillusioned with the direction of, of, of humans, you know, and, and, and their priorities. I mean, I've been reading Thoreau and, and being on the Bay throughout my teenage years. Like I had this sense of idealistic sort of place-based philosophy that uh, was really hitting up against the real world. I took a clay class my second semester after becoming friends with all the art students and immediately recognized that the world of ceramics sort of checks off all the boxes that I would want checked off for a lifetime pursuit. It's uh, intellectually stimulating, it engages your body, it's aesthetically oriented, it's functional, you know, there's chemistry, there's tradition, there's geology, there's just, like, there's everything and there's, and it's hard, you know? So there's like a lifetime of trajectory of challenge with it, which was great for me is a high energy 18 year old who, wanted something to push back. The first trip home during that semester, I think I made a point to find my great great grandfather's kiln site because I'd heard stories about my great great grandfather and grew up with, you know, jugs around the house, things like that. Found his old kiln site, a hundred acres back in the woods, dug clay from the vein in the creek next to his kiln site and brought it back to Eckerd to test. I think the next month I participated in the first wood firing, a uh, big Noboragama that um, my friend Tom Judge, who was an alumni of Eckerd, uh, hosted on his, his family's land in Florida. I was like, oh, well, I have to have this. I mean, that was it. You know, I mean, it was like that was the wood firing and the connection with my, with my family, being able to bring a piece of home down to Eckerd with me and really use it for therapeutic purposes if nothing else. Therapeutic centrally, just in a way that couldn't be intellectualized. Initially, clay was therapeutic. It was a way to, to find comfort and meaning uh, and connection to my home when I was young and uprooted and searching for something that would ground me. Every time I would come back home, I would find new clay deposits discover old kiln sites from the 1800s that had not been, that I knew nothing about or that had, had not been found archeologically. I've, I've actually made some discoveries about the kiln designs here that the archeologists and the folklorists and historians kind of overlook because they weren't potters. Um, also the clay tradition here on the Bay, like I said in the article, uh, was very different than the typical Appalachian groundhog kiln, face jug, alkaline glaze stuff that gets so much 
press and has gotten so much press over the last you know better part of a century and i just started piecing together uh not only the the, the local ceramic history of humans and and potters and potteries that were here but uh really got into geology and started to understand uh how the earth beneath our feet got put there and and i found a lot of meaning and i find a lot of meaning in understanding geologic story. Jill, you talk about not about being captured by a narrative, being captured by a story in clay rather than technical details. For me, it's the story of geology that holds fascination, that holds meaning, that that lifts me above the fray of just the muddy waters of what it is to be concerned with everyday human chatter. So to go in a clay mine or go uh, to the bottom of a ravine and find clay that, you know, unearth a chunk of clay that hasn't seen the light of day in 10 million years, right, is um, that's really what it's all about for me. When I get into a clay prospecting and material processing cycle, I enjoy that more than making pottery. It was so cool to get to know you through that story when while writing this and you mentioned that Fairhope was founded by as an intentional community and I found that in my research as well it's so cool this guy uh, it was Henry George right yeah 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 he, he was a progressive economist from the, the late 1800s and sort of philosopher you may you may have more uh, a fresher memory of, of his, his philosophy than I do. One of his kind of big ideas that the community was founded upon was communal ownership of land and not, not um, private property. And I thought that was a really yeah. cool thing. I don't know if I would call myself a, a Georgist or, or whatever, but I do you know, think that um, land ownership is a huge, is a huge issue and, and topic um, in our country and being able to decommodify it is 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 uh, something we should strive for just like George was saying and I think that using you know the fact that this land has been used by several generations worth of cultures a variety of different cultures along that path is is a pretty beautiful and poetic thing you know, in, in some respects, you know, obviously it's, there's a very, um, there's an awful history attached to land grabbing and indigenous people being kicked out and moved and confined into their res these reservations. In terms of the land itself and what's being produced by it, um, I think it's going back to the, Robin Wall Kilmer book, Braiding Sweetgrass, that you brought up, Jill, is uh, in that idea of naturalization. Can I, before you get into that, I just want to read the quote from her book about, so that we just have it here as a touchstone. Because there's so many ideas about many levels of home are coming up in this, you know, and, and who calls a place home and how that can be defined in so many ways. This book, Braiding Sweet Grass, that we all have had some exposure to, the author, Robin Wall Kimmerer, she writes, our immigrant plant teachers offer a lot of different models for how not to make themselves welcome on a new continent. Garlic mustard poisons the soil so that native species will die. Tamarisk uses up all the water. Foreign invaders like loose strife, kudzu, and cheatgrass have the colonizing habit of taking over others' homes and growing without regard to limits. But plantain is not like that. Its strategy was to be useful, to fit into small spaces, to coexist with others around the dooryard, to heal wounds. Plantain is so prevalent, so well integrated, that we think of it as native. It has earned the name bestowed by botanists for plants that have become our own. Plantain is not indigenous, but naturalized. And I just want to also underline that in both the stories about wild clay in 
the November issue of Studio Potter, there's a reference to tribes in Alabama and tribes in New Mexico, and that the clay they use is low fire, the wild clay there. But Zach and Betsy are both using high fire clay. So with that understanding, now, um, Harry, what were you going, what was, if I haven't thrown you completely off, what was uh, the point that you were going to make? No, thanks for bringing that up to the surface. I think what I was trying to say is that as makers, we're making objects that are, um, I mentioned this in the, in the article, uh, we're, we're no longer making things in response to a need necessarily for a community like like potters were um, during Homer Howard's time. Now we we get to make things based on the, the things that are, are interesting us, that are intriguing us. But at the same time, we're also able to make things that are out of out of need, but in a different way. Art art is necessary for our society, um, especially in, in times like these when things are turbulent. Uh, is one way to put it, but I think it's it's um, beautiful that we can, as as potters, be be like plantains, um, or at least try to be, and make in our respective spaces with the the history behind us in our minds. Thanks, Harry and. Zach, you said that you and your wife had started talking about this idea a little bit last night. Can you give us some highlights from that conversation reel? Yeah, I think about the, the pottery tradition here that, of my great great grandfather, Homer Howard, and the European colonizer descendant pottery, potteries that uh, sprang up and, you know, were, were everywhere in the 1800s, everywhere that there was a community. Uh, and in, in the case of Mobile Bay, there's a big port city and storage vessels and jugs. It was, it was part of the industry. I think about you know Native American cultures before that, how they used the clay and and used different different clay deposits, often adjacent to the same high fire clay deposit that uh, the European potters were using. And just on a technical note, I want to clarify for the viewers. You know, the big contrast between Native American potters and European descendant potters is, um, you know, the Native American potters did not have a potter's wheel and they didn't have kilns. For those reasons, they could not fire as hot. They could not fire to similar temperatures. So they sought out clays that would become more vitreous at the lower temperatures that were available to them. Coming back here, digging all this clay, going to all these old kiln sites, understanding the history, I have struggled to wrap my brain around the stories of the Native American potters and the stories of of these folk industry potters and, and what their, you know, I've, I've tried to imagine what their thoughts were, try to imagine what their intentions were and try to learn and understand what you know and from our my perspective uh, 200 years 150 years 100 years later you know and, and the current sort of issues that are really really at the surface about God, about you know just indigenous cultures and and trying to trying to really like the, the light is being shown so brightly on the injustices of the past and and how uh how much history has just been erased i think that when you're in it it might feel a little different. You might, you know, when you're in a tradition, you may not have any real self-awareness, especially when it's something like that's needed for the community, that's an industry that, you know, you, you set up for the Native Americans, you know, you set up a, a fishing camp at the mouth of a, a river and you make a bunch of pottery there while you're fishing because there's a clay deposit that's there. Uh, for, for example, in the 1700s, there's archaeological evidence that as soon as the Native American tribes here on Mobile Bay, at least one of them in one community, uh, got in contact with uh, British potters and settled in the same area, the Native American potters started making uh, forms that were derivative of the English potters and buying lead glazed 
lead to make glazes and make it they made a line of pottery in this community 150 years ago or 200 years ago i guess it would be or more um you know that that immediately adopted the new technology that they were being uh brought into just like you know native americans adopted horses and guns you know one of the reasons that i do pottery and that studio pottery exists now one of the reasons um is because of the work of bernard leach and Soji Hamada. Uh, that stuff was shoved down my throat uh, hard at Eckerd and, and in most most colleges. Um, certainly, there's there's broader influences, and a lot has been done in the last few decades to sort of shake off the limitations of the Bernard Leach, Soji Hamada, Minge stuff. My point is, you know, because Bernard Leach was an academic, because he went over, found this tradition in Japan, which I feel like from what I know of Japanese traditions, it's like kind of easy picking. Like once they go over there, like, you know, Japanese people in their ceramic culture seems to be so fastidious. They have names for everything. They have this super structured, hierarchical, like record kept tradition that is pretty disciplined. So once you get in there and like kind of like Bernard Leach did and like Soji Hamada was aware of and Yanagi and those folks, like they were really able to like glean a lot of well packaged information that was ready for export. And they did, and they wrote about it well, brought it to England, campaigned it in the United States, like really did a lot to um, create a body of intelligence that could be transferred to through through academia basically. You know, and for me, like that that's you know, where I got a lot of the packages of, of my information and ideas about how to look at pottery tradition, how to see back into history, and how to romanticize and prioritize certain types of practices over others. But the more that I've really looked deeply into the ceramic history of this place, and other places, the more I realize it's probably, it's just organic, messy continuum of, of human experience. And Harry, I, I know you've, you know, you've been to India and you, you know, you've been to China and you've seen, you probably possibly have a totally different, more uh, informed kind of perspective than I do about some things. But I really feel like there's this, as, as grateful as I am for the kind of academic tradition that I was um, empowered with and it was super empowering I've really had to do a, a, a lot of cleaning of the lenses to to keep looking back into history I just want to hop in and say like, I really love that yeah, no, imagery ahead. of like cleaning the lenses to look through history because it does get very complicated and it's like I'm trying to unweave a rug Zach I just want to circle back and clarify that your grandfather's practice when you came to know it was not a strong and alive tradition in your family, right? Right. I mean, there was, it had skipped a few generations. We had good stories that were intact. I had heard stories about my great great grandfather from, you know, from my grandmother and my great uncle and stuff. So, you know, that was all there, but it wasn't like, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, a living tradition. Uh, a couple of years ago, PBS. Uh, came in and did a uh, a statewide uh, documentary program on me and several other potters that had ties to traditional family pottery in Alabama. And they came down and did a firing with me and, you know, we went and dug clay and it, it's out there if you want to online if you want to see it. But I finally met a couple of the other families that were involved in the the documentary as well. And it were it was guys that had um, really direct ties. You know, like they grew up in a traditional pottery in central Alabama. And when I met them it was like it was such a culture shock. I mean really like truly culture shock. Because they had no academic training. They had no perspective on all the all the stuff I've been talking about. 
in the way that I had, but, but they talked about, you know, how their uncle beat them if they didn't mix clay correctly or um, that they, they went through like 5,000 pounds of clay a week in the studio. They measured their kiln in gallons. How many, and they, they, they set their price list in gallons. And everything was cheap, like really cheap. You know, when they talked about clay, it was not the same language that, that I use of, to talk about clay. You know, of course they dig their own clay, but it's just, it's total, total different world. It was such a shock. Interesting. I mean, Harry, how does that line up? I'm, I am curious to know how this lines up with your experiences, because traveling as you have, you've encountered this kind of phenomenon, right? Where it's not some elevated higher plane of academic people who have the privilege of choosing to make pots, but it's like, this is how we're gonna make our living. This is how our family has made our living. Um, what parallel, like what things are coming up in your head in this conversation? Well, as much traveling as I've done, most of it has been in the United States and firing, you know, around wood firing has been totally informed by the things that Zach brought up earlier with Bernard and Hamada and Yanagi and uh, Minge and all this stuff and, and Japanese, the Japanese conception of wood firing, you know, firing for effects created by the fire itself, you know, not, not like firing with wood just because that's the kind of kiln you had and putting salt in, you know, like early because that kind of wood firing was was around long before this craze of kind of Japanese influence wood firing came to America. But in India specifically also the the, the wood firing was directly a um, uh, an influence from Americans who had been influenced by the Minge ideas there. Um, Ray Meeker and Deborah Smith, they both came out of the University of Southern California, um, Susan Peterson students, uh, and they went over there and and built India's first wood kilns because the the traditions in India were all around, um, were all low fire terracotta, um, mostly ceremonial and useful village pots. And there's there's one other there's one other guy, um, Guchanan Singh, who who also was a student of um, the leech pottery who went and apprenticed. Um, he was from Northern India and went up, um, worked with leech and came back down and started a, a high fire pottery in Delhi called Delhi Blue Pottery. In terms of the, the way that those two things, the, the traditional pots in India and the, the wood firing kind of culture coming in from the outside intermix is not very much. The, the one thing that I noticed while in, in India, kind of walking the streets and seeing stalls of terracotta pots was there are s every now and then you'll see a stall that has a, um, a couple of terracotta forms with very, I don't know if we can consider them this yet, like Western style handles, like with intentionally articulated connection points, you know, not blended. It seems to be a very American way to <laughs> attach handles. And so you can see some little subtle details like that in these stalls because they had worked at the Golden Bridge Pottery for um, one period or another as like a production potter or something because Golden Bridge was sourcing local village potters for the production um, early on before they started holding classes and teaching people the, the techniques that they had brought there and, and established, going on to establish their own like high fire studios. I guess the point that I'm I'm trying to make is that the is right right along there with Zach's and how it's kind of this messy continuum of of things that are happening and folding into one another from one place to the next. What what is in the future for you? And Harry, I really hope you're gonna write a book. Yeah, I'm excited for Harry. I really am. Harry, you're making wonderful work. You're mm -hmm. a universally uh loved guy. Um, and I think you've endeared yourself to a lot of people around the country in a way that, and around the world in a way that is just going to be wonderful for, for uh, ceramics in the future, and hopefully for you too. As far as my legacy and, you know, looking forward, maybe I said this in the article, I don't know. I like art. I like pot. You know, for me, 
pottery making, digging my own clay, um, and teaching in the community is, is a way to see the natural systems of geology, human industry and history, and uh, come together in our daily lives in, in a way that we can we can trace the story back. It's it's really just about educating and finding a path to understanding story that that that's behind everything in our world. With handmade ceramics, it's just easy to like take each step incrementally and for me at least and find all those points of connection and understanding from the object that we use every day to the making process and its traditions in human history to the geology and the story of the earth itself and the forces that create things that are so much bigger than our imagination. I want to educate people in order to do that for themselves and create a space where those kind of uh, insights and understandings are fostered and encouraged. Thank you. How about you, Harry? Well, I don't... at risk of like echoing all the things that Zach just said, I mean, that's really kind of where my mind is at too. I, I my goal has long been to establish a place, um, a home base and to, to build a kiln there and, and, and start making pots and engaging the community with what I'm doing and teaching and all the above. It's that's, that's the dream. Um, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but all my energies are focused in that direction. That's how, well, I hope that you, I don't doubt that you'll make it happen, Harry. Thank you so much for taking time to, to visit. It's a great conversation. I look forward to visiting with you on another day. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, thank all right. Take care, y'all. Exactly. Bye-bye. Thanks to all who are listening. If you aren't a member of Studio Potter yet, why not join today so you can read new stories each month from the global community of ceramic artists and have access to our archive of nearly 50 years of the Studio Potter Journal for only $5 a month. I'm Jill Foot Hutton, co-editor of Studio Potter. Be well, everyone, and thanks for reading.